The seven seas of the earth will be turned into blood. Every river and stream will become as blood. Every basin in your home will run with hot and cold blood. This plague will produce mind-numbing thirst from which there will be no relief. This week on Connecting the Gap, we continue our study on prophecies of the Bible as we continue verse by verse the Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 11 this week, and we're going to get kicked right back into that right after this. Well, as White Snake would say, here we go again. Welcome once again to the podcast, Connecting the Gap. I'm Daniel Moore, your host. Thank you for joining me this week. We have been going through an extensive study in Revelation, going verse by verse for quite some time now. That's been the extended part of our study for Prophecies of the Bible. This is a study put out by Damon Duck, and I'm sharing that with you. Thank you once again for joining me this week. Go to my website, connectingthegap.net. There you can get hooked up with my podcast, the many platforms that we are on. You can subscribe and please share. Uh, Every week I send this out and a few people will share it. Uh, Some don't. I would just greatly appreciate if you would share this and help this podcast to grow because it's basically a Bible study. And the more people that have access to this, the better. And uh, we can just all study together and learn about God's Word. So if you would uh, do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. I do have social media, got uh, Facebook, and I'm on Twitter as well. Those links are on my website also, so please go to connectingthegap.net and check all of that out. And I thank you so much for listening each week here as we endeavor to connect the gap and with our Bible study. So this week we're going to be starting off where we left off last week. We made it through Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. And as we know that Muslims and Islam have a lot to do with the end times, uh, last week, if you missed that, There towards the end of the episode, we went through a pretty extensive description of Islamic and the Muslim people and the differences between them and Christians. A very interesting section to that podcast last week. And as we get into this week, we're going to start off with Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, and talk about the two witnesses. This is something that's brought up quite often. It says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Well, in the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, or the Ten Commandments, required two witnesses to validate matters pertaining to Jewish religion. In the same way, God will send two witnesses to prophesy and validate the world's sin and blasphemy during the tribulation period. The identities of these witnesses are unknown, but most experts agree that one of them will be Elijah. The main reason for this agreement is a verse found in Old Testament. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. Currently, Elijah is in heaven, but he will return to earth before the tribulation period. Elijah and the second witness will stay and prophesy for 1260 days, or three and one half years. Experts agree that this will be the first three and one half years of the tribulation period. The two witnesses will wear sackcloth. This type of entire undoubtedly seems too strange to us, but can be explained with help from the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets wore sackcloth, that's a coarse cloth worn as a sign of mourning, when they were ministering to people who were deeply involved in sin. Sackcloth, however, is also worn as a garment of mourning. Most likely, the Jews of the tribulation period will be grieving over their sins and their relationship with God. Most people want to know who the two witnesses will be. Some say Elijah and Enoch. Others say Elijah and John the Baptist. Still others suggest Elijah and Moses. I believe they will be Jews, but no one knows for sure. It may possibly be that God does not tell us because it is not important. Today, leaders of a Jewish group called the Temple Mount and Land of Israel Faithful put on sackcloth and ashes on Jewish feast days and prayed to the Temple Mount to worship. The Jewish Sanhedrin has been brought back into existence, and these religious scholars believe Elijah will soon appear before their group to announce the identity of the Messiah. 
They believe the Holy One will be a descendant of King David, so they are using DNA to identify people who might qualify. They are also working to change Israel's political system from a ruling prime minister to a king. But many prophecy experts find this troubling because they fear the Sanhedrin will create their own hand-picked Elijah and mistakenly identify the Antichrist as their Messiah and King. Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. That's John chapter 5, verse 43. N.W. Hutchings was quoted, And as much as the Antichrist will stop Jewish service in the temple at the middle of the tribulation, as quoted in Daniel 9.27, then verses 2 and 3 of chapter 11 must be either the beginning of the tribulation or the very end of the first half of the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 4, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Here, each witness is represented by one olive tree and one lampstand. It takes two symbols to represent one person. To understand this passage, we need to know that these symbols must mean something. The answer to the olive trees is found in Zechariah 4, verses 2-6. through Two olive trees stand by a lampstand and provide oil to the lampstand. This oil represents the Holy Spirit. The two witnesses will be olive trees because they will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4 verses 11 through 14 explains what the lampstands represent. The lampstands hold pots of burning oil that provide light. The two witnesses will be lampstands because they will provide light to a dark world. Now combine the two symbols. Each witness will be one olive tree filled with the Holy Spirit and one lampstand giving off the light of God. They will be two witnesses filled with the Holy Spirit counteracting the forces of darkness in the world. This continues to show the grace of God during the tribulation period. He will go to great lengths to reach out to the lost, to offer them blessings, and to be their God. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 5, And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. God told Jeremiah, I will make my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. That's Jeremiah 5, 14. Those who reject the word of God will be like wood when it is consumed by fire. The two witnesses will be invincible. They will have the supernatural power of the word of God in their mouths. When their enemies try to harm them, they will merely speak to consume their enemies. Revelation chapter 11, verse 6. These have powers to shut heaven, so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. These two men will have unlimited power. They will be able to stop the rain from falling, turn water to blood, and smite the earth with many different kinds of plagues. Those are afflictions or calamities that are sometimes viewed as an act of God. Without rain for three and a half years, the ground will be cracked and dry like old leather, and the dust will be ankle deep. When the waters turn to blood, they will be unfit to drink and uninhabitable for fish. There is no telling what the other plagues will do. But one thing is for sure, this will not be the same planet that we know today. David Jeremiah and C.C. Carlson was quoted, The two witnesses will tell men to their faces about their human wickedness. They will stab hearts with warning of future judgments, even worse than the past. The hatred this pair arouses will be intense. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 7, When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. The two witnesses will be supernaturally protected. Nothing will harm them. However, when they have finished their assignment of providing light to a dark and evil world, they will be killed. Revelation mentions two beasts. The Antichrist and the False Prophet. The Antichrist will hate the two witnesses. He will fail to cope with their condemnation of his world government, religion, social principles, and economic system, and will be infuriated when he hears them preaching about Jesus. He will be jealous of their number of converts, so he will throw all of the power of his satanic government into an attack against them. The witnesses will be overpowered and killed. 
The preacher's outline in Sermon Bible says, Scripture never really uses the term Antichrist to refer to the great man of lawlessness who is to appear in the end time. It does refer to false teachers as Antichrist. That's 1 John 2.22. However, down through the centuries, believers have always referred to the coming man of lawlessness as the Antichrist. Why? Because he is to stand so opposed to Christ and fiercely persecute believers. He will be the very embodiment of evil against Christ and against the followers of Christ. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, And their dead bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Several cities are called great cities in the Bible. This great city, however, is clearly identified as the city where the Lord was crucified, which can only be Jerusalem. In the days of Isaiah, Jerusalem was a wicked place. Things were so bad that Isaiah compared Jerusalem to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was strong language considering God destroyed those cities with fire and brimstone. In the days of Ezekiel, Jerusalem played the harlot and chased after idols and false gods. God said they acquired their adulterous and idolatrous ways in Egypt. Remember the golden calf the Israelites built on their way from Egypt to the Promised Land. In Christ's day, Jerusalem was full of sin again. The leaders falsely accused him, tried him, and had him beaten and crucified. They offered daily sacrifices at the temple that were not what God wanted. Jerusalem will be full of sin again in the tribulation period. It will become even more sinful after the temple is rebuilt. Worship of the Antichrist will flourish, while worship of Jesus will be condemned. God's two witnesses will be killed in Jerusalem, and no one will bother to bury them. Revelation 11:9 Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. In Bible times, because of heat and sanitation, people were often buried within 24 hours. Some were buried in caves or tombs, making it possible for friends and relatives to go back and anoint the body over the next few days. Some were buried with a bell tied around their finger that would ring if they moved. And that brings the quote, saved by the bell. Family often waited a minimum of three days before declaring someone dead. This may be why Jesus waited until the fourth day to raise his friend Lazarus. That's in John eleven seventeen. After three days, Lazarus was officially dead, and no one would question it. The dead bodies of the two witnesses will lie in the street three and a half days. By Jewish standards, they will be officially dead. No one will accept their remains. Multitudes from other people, tribe, and nations will see their corpses and refuse them burial. John Hagee was quoted, Prophecy states that the whole world will, at the same time, be able to see the two witnesses in the streets of Jerusalem. My father's generation could not explain that. How could the whole world see two dead men lying in the streets of Jerusalem at one time? It was a mystery. Then came television, followed by international satellites, the internet, and wireless communication. Revelation chapter 11, verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. When Jesus was born, wise men traveled from the east to see him. When they arrived, they fell down and worshipped him with great joy and presented him with extravagant gifts. We, too, celebrate the birth of Jesus by worshipping him and exchanging gifts at Christmas. When the bodies of the two witnesses are lying in the street, the inhabitants of the earth will gloat. They will be proud of their Antichrist, proud they are following him, and proud of his great power because no one else could harm the two witnesses. They will praise his victory, worship him, and exchange gifts. The celebration will be like an Antichrist Christmas. Call it the first Antichristmas. Some people just refuse to understand that God is going to win. In Revelation 11, 11, Now after the three and a half days the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. This incredible scene is beyond human comprehension. The two witnesses will be killed. Television cameras or something similar will broadcast pictures of their body lying in the streets around the world. No one will move them. 
the cameras will remain focused on the corpses while the whole world begins to celebrate. Food will probably be scarce, but parties will abound. Festivities will continue for three days or more. Then God will suddenly step in. He will do what he did when he created Adam in Genesis 2-7. He will breathe life into the two witnesses, causing them to move. The parting will stop. The revelry will end. The whole world will watch in terror as the two witnesses stand to their feet. J. Vernon McGee was quoted, While the world is celebrating in jubilation the death of these witnesses, and while the television cameras are focused upon them, the witnesses will stand on their feet. All of the networks will regret that they had their cameras pointed to the witnesses, because the networks will not really want to give the news as it is. Revelation chapter 11, verse 12. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, skeptics tried to explain away his resurrection by blaming his disciples for carrying out an elaborate hoax. However, the world will not be able to claim a hoax when the two witnesses rise from the dead and disappear into heaven. Everyone will know they died because their bodies will lie in the street for three and a half days. Everyone will also know the witnesses will rise from the dead when they stand up. Then, while some are wondering what to do, a great voice from heaven will call the two witnesses to heaven. None of their enemies will be able to harm them as they disappear into heaven in a cloud. They will only be able to look on in amazement. When Jesus ascended into heaven, many did not believe. When the church is raptured, the world will not believe. Excuses will abound to save people from the harsh reality of the truth. But when the two witnesses ascend to heaven, many will change their mind about Jesus and the rapture. To those who will struggle to survive the persecution of the Antichrist during the last half of the tribulation period, this is a message of hope. Remain faithful. If the Antichrist kills you, God will raise you from the dead. He will tell you what he told John in Revelation 4.1 and what he will tell the two witnesses. Come up here. Revelation chapter 11, verse 13. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. When the two witnesses stand to their feet, panic will spread around the world. Then as people are wondering what will happen next, the two witnesses will ascend to heaven. They will still be staring at the sky when the ground will begin to shake. 10% of the buildings in Jerusalem will collapse, killing 7,000 people. The fear of God will enter the hearts of the survivors. Many will change their minds about the two witnesses, praise the God of heaven, and begin a Jewish revival. Notice how good can come from things like earthquakes and death. God can use apparent disasters to bring about change. In this case, multitudes of Jews will see a great miracle and start praising God just before the Antichrist desecrates the temple. The message of the Christian Jew says, Over 90 major earthquakes have taken place in Israel in the last 2,000 years, with an average of 27 years between each. In the last 100 years, over 1,000 earthquakes of all measurable intensities have been recorded. Scientists predict another earthquake in Israel, but they are not prepared to say whether it will be next week or the next century. Complete buildings, including the Dome of the Rock in 1546, and even whole cities, safed in 1837, were totally destroyed in past centuries. There's a couple other instances where earthquakes happened. In Matthew 27, verse 51 to 52, when Jesus died, the earth shook. Also in Matthew 28, 2, when Jesus arose, there was a violent earthquake. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. This earthquake in Jerusalem will mark the end of the second woe, or the sixth trumpet. The seventh trumpet will sound soon and bring the third woe. Revelation 11.15 brings us that seventh trumpet. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. When the seventh trumpet sounds, there will be a heavenly declaration that God and his son Jesus will be taking over. 
The Apostle Paul talked about this when he said, Then comes the end, when he, or Jesus, delivers the kingdom of God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule, all authority, and power. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 24. But remember that the sounding of the seventh trumpet unleashes the seven bull judgments. They are one and the same, so the world will still have a way to go. Satan is the head of these rulers, authorities, and powers. They are organized and influence the nations to do evil. However, before the tribulation period ends, God and his son will do away with them. God will take over and transform this world into a better place. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 16 and 17, And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The announcement that God and Jesus will be taking over will cause a tremendous reaction in heaven. The church will fall down on their faces and worship God. They will thank Him because He is alive and will be exercising His great power by starting this earthly reign. From this point on, Satan's days will be drawing quickly to a close. Jesus will begin to exercise the authority over nations that became His when He died on the cross. He will go forth to conquer the forces of evil and usher in the millennium. The 24 elders represent the church from Pentecost to the rapture. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Satan will know this day will soon end, so he will stir the anger of the nations. At the same time he does that, God's wrath will burn brighter, which will put Satan and Jesus on a collision course. Satan will unite the nations against Jesus. The ensuing conflict is referred to as the Battle of Armageddon. That's the last and greatest war before the millennium. Everyone is accountable to God. No one will escape his judgment. Even the dead will be judged. But the righteous will be rewarded before the judgment seat of Christ for reverencing the name of Jesus, and the wicked will be destroyed for their unrepented sin. In Revelation, it talks about several instances of the wrath of God. The first is the wrath of the Lamb. That's Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. The second, the great day of His wrath. That's Revelation 6, 17. The third, your wrath has come. Revelation 11, 18. Then the wrath of God. Revelation 15, 1. The bulls of the wrath of God. That's Revelation 16, 1. The wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's Revelation 16, 19. And the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's Revelation 19, verse 15. In Revelation 11, 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Following the heavenly worship service, described in the three preceding verses, when the elders declare that Satan will stir the nations against God's people, God will open his heavenly temple. He has a temple similar to the tabernacle Moses constructed in the wilderness. God's heavenly temple houses the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat rests on top of the Ark, where the blood of sacrificial goats was sprinkled for the sins of God's people. The Ark with its mercy seat will be a reminder that God has always shown mercy to His people. Satan will stir the nations against Israel. The lightning, noises, thunder, earthquakes, and hailstorms will be signs of God's wrath to come, but God will show mercy by protecting Israel. Most people do not understand the consequences of all the earthquakes that will take place during the tribulation period. Most of these quakes will be stronger than the 7.6 tremor that shook Pakistan in 2005. In addition to the multiple thousands that were killed and millions that were left homeless, it was estimated that more than 1,000 hospitals were totally destroyed. Perhaps this helps explain why pestilence will kill so many during the tribulation period. It will be next to impossible to find well-equipped medical facilities. 
The Ark of the Covenant was a rectangular shaped box made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. It had two rings on each side so that staves could be inserted to carry it. It had a gold lid on top called the mercy seat. On the gold lid were two cherubim with their wings spread over the mercy seat and looking down at the box which contained the earthly presence of God. The Ark was kept in the Holy of Holies in the temple, the high priest would go there, pour blood of sacrificial animals on the mercy seat as an atonement for sin, and God would communicate with them. The ark was a symbol of God's presence with his people, his protection of them, his mercy, and his forgiveness. That's going to wrap up chapter 11 of Revelation as we continue our study on prophecies of the Bible. And I think what we're going to do, we're just a little bit short of 30 minutes this week. But we're going to go ahead and stop here. This will give us a good stopping point so that we can start Revelation chapter 12 fresh next week here on Connecting the Gap as we come back next Thursday. So thank you guys once again for sitting through with me for this last 30 minutes for another episode of Connecting the Gap. We're studying a study on prophecies of the Bible and doing a verse-by-verse -verse study of Revelation. This is based on a study by Damon Duck, and next week we'll continue that. Go, don't forget to go to my website, connectingthegap.net. There you can check out my podcast platform, subscribe and share, ring the bell on YouTube. We're also on the podcasting app Edify and Rumble, so please go subscribe to one of those, whatever you, you like the best for your social media. And each week you'll get the notification at, that we are putting out a new podcast, and you can study God's Word with us here at Connecting the Gap. Also, don't forget that if you have not given your life to Christ, that's the ultimate most important decision that you could ever make and as, as we've been reading through this the study is not by any means to scare anyone uh, there's a, a, a thought process out there today that christians just like to use the bible and the end times and uh, judgment and all that kind of thing just to scare people into loving jesus but that's not what this is all about what this is telling us is what is to come but us as Christians, if we love God and we believe that Jesus died for our sins on that cross and we start following in his footsteps and allow him to guide and lead us in everything that we do and start living that Christian life that was always meant for us and we reach out to others and witness and share the love of Christ to others, we will not even be here to worry about any of this stuff as we're going to be in eternity with our God and Heavenly Father. So this is not in any way to scare anybody. This is just to let you know what's coming um, biblically, as the Bible tells us, and for us to be ready and for us to know how important it is to share this message with those that are lost so that all of those can come to heaven with us and can escape all of these horrible judgments. So again, if you've not been saved, go to my website, connectingthegap.net. There's a page there on how you can accept Christ into your heart. It's the best decision that you'll ever make. And if you have any questions, please don't forget that you can reach out to us here at Connecting the Gap. There's a contact form there you can fill out. Send us an email at daniel at connectingthegap.net and I'll answer your questions the best that I can, get you a Bible or whatever your needs may be. We just want you to understand and begin to live and enjoy that life with Christ as it's meant to be after Jesus died on that cross for our sins. Well, I'm out of here for this week. I'll be back again next week as we continue our study on prophecies of the Bible, and we'll be in Revelation chapter 12. Until then, don't forget that God's Word never fails us. God's Word has stood the test of time, and through Jesus' death on the cross, He has connected the gap.